I'm very excited to welcome Crescenzo Scipione from Buffalo Class Action, and he's going to do a talk on entitled "What is Anarchism?" So now for today's talk, Crescenzo, it's all okay. all yours. So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Crescenzo Scipione, and I'm a member and general secretary of Buffalo Class Action, uh, which is Buffalo's local anarchist organization. Um, we are affiliated with the um, regionally with the Common Struggle Libertarian Communist Federation, um, and we are sister organizations with an organization in Rochester called Rochester Red and Black. As a side note, if anyone would like, um, on the front of those little blue marble things, uh, there's some pamphlets uh, that were printed uh, by our sister organization in Rochester called Are You an Anarchist? The Answer May Surprise You. Um, by a pretty well-known uh, anarchist academic called David Graeber. Um, feel free to take those. Um, David Graeber, by the way, um, I believe is the person credited with, uh, with coining the 1%, um, the 99% branding language for Occupy Wall Street. So, uh, what is, oh, a, as an aside, um, so I'm up here at a podium, but uh, in keeping with the with the spirit of anarchism, uh, feel free to just shoot your hands up at any point. I mean, I'll ask for questions at the end, but if you have a question yes. in the middle that you might forget or something, feel free to shoot your hand up, and I'll, I can just address it uh, right then and there, unless it's giant, and then I'll come back to it. Um, so, uh, the first, uh, first, in order to answer the question, what is anarchism? Um, first, because the, um, the, the concept of anarchism, or the word, anarchism or anarchy has been uh, used in, in so many very different ways, often by people hostile to the idea um, who have spread uh, lies and half-truths about it, um, that it's necessary first to ask the question, what isn't anarchism? Um, and those, just run down the list, um, commonly held conceptions of chaos, violence, uh, you know, someone in a someone in a black black mask throwing a bomb through a window and killing people. Like the, these are not the, these these perhaps have been done by a few anarchists throughout history, um, but they've been done by patriotic Americans throughout history. They've been done by a certain segment of any population of people. It has nothing to do with anarchism or its ideas. Um, okay, so what is anarchism then? Um, so I'm going to run through, firstly, uh, the couple of main ideas to what are, um, what are we against, what are we for, and then what are our general strategies for getting from where we are to where we would like to be. Um, the first, and the things that we're against, um, anarchism, uh, anarchists are anti-authoritarians uh, and anti-capitalists. Um, and we are for, um, we are for a, a, um, a working class, a socialist society uh, with common ownership of the necessities of life. Um, and I'll run through those. So, uh, anti-authoritarianism. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty similar to to the general conception that people have of, of the notion of freedom, right? Um, uh, one of the most famous, probably the most famous uh, anarchist in the world, uh, uh, linguist and academic called Noam Chomsky, um, has has phrased it really well, saying that anti-authoritarianism is the belief that for any form of authority or coercion or use of force, the burden of proof lies with the authority. So this is not to say that there are never justified forms of authority, but that it's it's on the the person doing the person or organization or institution doing the coercing to prove that its use of force is justified. All right. So the you know common examples. Um, you know, a parent pulls their five-year-old out from in front of a truck, right? This is a coercive use of force, right? This infringes on the autonomy of the five-year-old. However, we commonly accept it as okay. We accept this as just and justified uh, because of its circumstances. Um, you know, other extreme examples, um, you know, uh, executing dissidents for exercising free speech, for instance, is the opposite extreme, right? Obviously unjustified, unjustifiable, use of, of force uh, in the form of tyranny. Um, so what we believe is that all forms of coercive force have the burden of proof that their uh, coercion is justified and that if they, if they don't or can't 
uh, can't meet that burden of proof, if they can't prove that their use of force is justified, then uh, they are unjust, and that form of, of, coerci of coercive authority has to be abolished, done away with, or fundamentally altered in some way. Um, I'm sorry? I'm not clear who is speaking to us. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so uh, the second thing, um, that anarchists are anti-capitalists. Um, this is somewhat more specific. Um, anarchists identify capitalism as one of the um, as one of the most egregious forms of unjust authority. That is the rule of a tiny minority of the world's population, uh, what we would call the capitalist class, um, the wealthy, the owners of industry, those who control um, the means of economic development, and those who control the means of survival. Right? These also happen to be the same people who run most of the governments in the world, that sort of thing. Um, and so, so anti-authoritarianism is fairly standard, uh, comes out of the Enlightenment, classical liberal ideas. The anti-capitalism, um, anarchists tend to uh, fall fairly in line uh, with uh, some, some analysis that comes out of classical Marxism, um, which is that we are opposed to capitalism on the basis that it exploits uh, workers who are the um, you know, in, in the Occupy parlance, the 99%, right? Um, the rest of us who don't own factories or don't own banks and corporations don't control the means of our own survival, and the only thing that we have to ensure our own survival is our ability to sell our own labor power, right? We, we as human beings, have the power to rent ourselves to the capitalists to do whatever job they're willing to pay us to do, by the way, at whatever wage rate they choose to want to uh, pay us. Right. Um, well, and it's, it's free agreement. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's a it's a free agreement in the sense that you have the choice to work or starve, um, and if you consider that free, then you know I, I guess um, you know more power to you, right? Um, anarchists anarchists uh, see a world in which uh, in which you have more choices than than rent yourself to a boss or starve to death or you know or exist in dire uh, poverty and destitution. So I want to try and take you up on your invitation to be anarchic and to throw out questions. So you're on this line of questioning and I, of speaking, and I have a line of questions that just pops up as logical, right? Okay. That sort of your opponent, your dialectical opponent, let's say the capitalist. Right, would bring to the fore. So your response is to uh, the idea, well, it's a free agreement, a contract, right? Your response is, well, sure, you're agreeing to either work or starve. But then I think the comeback from the capitalist is, I'm not making that choice. I'm simply giving you an opportunity. In other words, yeah. in other words Mr. David Koch says, I didn't create poverty. Sure. I'm giving you a chance to make some money. Sure. And 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 we're and we're in the room with David Koch, and David Koch says to me, "I don't create poverty." The response would be, "That's a lie. Yes, you do. You and people like you create poverty. We exist in a world where, um, you know, let's say take something as very basic as food or housing. Right? Um, if I don't work." The reason that, sure, it's, it would be a voluntary thing for me to choose, I don't want to work, or my job sucks, I'm going to quit my job, but then I'm not going to have the money from that job that I need to buy the food from, who again? The capitalists, who own, the, who own agriculture, who own supermarkets, who, who have the means to survival, right? And so we exist in the, we exist in the context of a world in which all the means of survival are controlled by the same people that we need to rent ourselves to in order to survive, right? um, and so this uh, th this this illusion of of a, of a free contract is that uh, is that it's an illusion. Um, I would uh, continuing on the the basic analysis of why anarchists are against capitalism um, that in in uh, in that wage relationship that relationship between um, the worker and their boss. Um, 
we agree with uh, mainstream Marxists, socialists, uh, things like that, um, in seeing this relationship as exploitative. Um, and the main reason that we see it this way is because of the theory of surplus value. And what that is, it sounds very sort of you know, dense and economical. It's essentially, um, if I uh, say work in a in a shoe factory, and I make, and I get paid five dollars an hour, and in an hour I make a hundred dollars worth of shoes, then you know I don't I don't I get five dollars for that hour, not a hundred. The difference, right? The remaining ninety-five dollars goes to my boss, who didn't make the shoes, who didn't, you know, who, who didn't do any of, of any of the work for these things, right? And so we see that the worker has actually produced a hundred dollars worth of value, and yet is only paid five dollars of that value. And we see this as exploitative, um, because the boss who who gets the ninety five percent of the and these numbers are totally arbitrary, by the way. Um, usually the proportion is much higher than ninety five percent, but the, the boss gets to take 95% of what you have produced with your with your hands, your work, and your labor, simply by virtue of the fact that the boss has a piece of paper that says that they own the factory that you work in, the tools that you work with, which coincidentally were made by other workers, right? And so we see a world in which the working class, or as Occupy likes to say, the 99% have produced absolutely everything, and yet control a minuscule proportion of the world's wealth, resources uh, and means of survival. Um, and so question. Yes, um, now, you speak on, I don't need no microphone, I don't need no microphone. Um, now, do you know anything about peace work? I'm sorry? Do you know anything about peace work? Is, is that a, is that a specific organization? No, I used to do peace work. You say, okay, no, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't hear me on what I'm talking about. Do you know anything about peace work? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> okay, I worked in the plant. Where I did either either I got paid by the hour or how much I made off the piece work. If I made put out more production, I got paid what I made for. So my pay was higher. If I did not make more than I was on my, my flat rate, which was the five or ten dollars, whatever it was an hour. Sure. That's why I say you saying the factories, all factories are not alike. Yeah, sure. And there are different there are different uh, you know, di different ways in which people are paid. Um, yeah. And, and sure, and, and some people are also are also salaried workers, and some people work purely on commission. Some people work at a at a, a wage base rate uh, plus commission. But if you work for uh, for a capitalist business, the amount of money that they sell whatever you make for is always going to add up to more than what they pay you to make it. Otherwise, they wouldn't make a profit. That's where profit comes from. It's it's just sort of definitional, right? That's where the extra money comes from that they pocket and call profit. That they either reinvest or just you know go buy a yacht or something with it. Um, uh, so so yeah, that's that's uh, basically um, uh, why we see capitalism as exploitative. It also has harmful effects, um, such as that um, the. The structure of capitalism also requires a large proportion of the population at any time. Well, not not a large as in 50% of the population, but a sizable number of people to be unemployed at any given time. Right? This is the reason why there's never been full employment in any capitalist nation ever in history, ever. Right? If there were no people who were unemployed, then the boss wouldn't get to say, well, if you don't like your job and your working conditions, you're fired and I'll get somebody else. Because there, ha there has to be somebody else who doesn't have a job who's willing to take your job. Otherwise, you're in a position to bargain with your employer, and your employer does not want that. Um, um, there's, uh, there's also the anarchist uh, opposition to um, what's in, cla in classical anarchist texts, and by classical I mean over 100 years ago, um, the notion of private property. I want to clarify this. Um, anarchists are not against people owning their own toothbrushes. Um, you know, this is, this is, we would make a distinction between personal property and productive property, right? You're allowed to own your own toothbrush, your own clothes, your own home, that sort of thing. Um, but that things like a lake, things like a factory, things like a large tract of land, right, should be, uh, should be the property of the commons, of society as a whole, of all the people, right? Things that are necessary for the survival of everyone, everyone should have a degree of say and control in what happens and what is done with those things. Um, uh, 
uh, we are also um, anarchists famously opposed to the state. Um, and this, this is, a, is pretty much just a logical extension of the argument against capitalism. The state is simply the organization created by the capitalists 150 years ago when the, when the capitalists uh, you know, overthrew the kings and the monarchs and the aristocrats. You know, 150 years ago, they created this government to ensure their interests, right? The state works for the capitalists. This is very basic, and they are the political and military rule of the capitalist class. Um, and so it's very basic. They, they are, you know, when you, if there's, if there's a labor dispute uh, and the workers go on strike, and, they're, and you know, usually they'll bring in scabs uh, from that reserve army of the unemployed, but even if somehow they can't do that, they can't bring in scabs for whatever reason or they choose not to, right? Or even if they do bring in scabs, if you have a strike, I mean, if anyone's been to a, a strike, you know, a lot of times, if there's not an active arbitration process that's run by the state, they send in the police, right? These are not private security that are working for the employer. You know, it's not a voluntary contract, right? The state is not neutral. It sends in police to force you back to work, you know, or to, or to terrorize you and inflict violence upon you until you agree to continue uh, this relationship with your boss as your boss wants it. Um, we also are opposed to the state in that it, uh, in that it, in that nation states uh, facilitate wars, um, and anarchists are against wars. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, the one of our famous slogans, and it's not just for anarchists, but no war but class war, um, or no, uh, you know, class struggle or whatever. Um, or uh, another one is, um, oh, what is it? No war between nations, no peace between classes, right? that we see that this, this basic relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor, between the capitalists and the workers, exists pretty much everywhere in the world now. I mean, throughout the last century and a half, the capitalists have pretty much conquered the globe. There aren't that many pre-capitalist societies that remain. There are a few scattered indigenous societies that have managed to not be uh, you know, wiped out yet. But most of the world uh, exists under this paradigm, and uh, and one of the center points of anarchism is that we're not for anarchism in the United States. We're not for anarchism in Bolivia. We're not for anarchism in Germany. We're for anarchism in the world. Uh, and we understand that this relationship is global, and thus the solution has to also be global, and the struggle for it has to be global. So, uh, those, these are the things that we're against, uh, things that we're for. Um, Another scary word that I want to take a moment to, to sort of just uh, clarify, uh, we are for socialism, and by that we do not mean the, the Soviet Union. We do not mean China, we do not, need, we do not mean North Korea. Um, we don't even mean, uh, you know, Hugo Chavez and Venezuela and, and, and uh, countries in the Bolivarian Alliance in South America right now. We do not mean a government controlled by a socialist party that runs everything. We don't mean any of that. Um, what we mean, and this is originally what socialism meant, um, is democratic control of the economy. It is that when you go to work, um, you should have a democratic say in your workplace. Right? Um, and as an aside, this is being done right now, even within the capitalist framework. Um, you know, cooperatives, uh, open source has actually been a really wonderful uh, example of, of some of this stuff. You know, people, uh, you know, and there are specific reasons why it happens in internet and technology and not in other industries, but, um, you know, people come to work and, you know, Monday through Thursday, they do the work and on Friday, you have a meeting and decide, you know, what needs to be made, how much do we need to make it, who's working what times, how, we, you know, how are we going to all do this, right? And who's, you know, who's going to be the supervisor next week? These, you know, if we require a supervisor or a manager, let's elect them, right? Let's have these things be run by all the people who are doing the work. Incidentally, cooperatives and companies that have implemented this, this form have often grown really quickly. Um, because it turns out that the workers who do the work know more and better about how to do it better, more, faster, more safely than the managers who don't do the work. Um, which, again, seems like fairly common sense, but we're taught not to talk about these things. 
Um, so we propose not only work, uh, workplace democracy of the kind I just described, um, but also um, a control of the economy in general, right? So not um, a, a supposedly free market where, uh, you know, where the invisible hand, right, which supposedly has, you know, like there's a hand, but there's no, there's no body, there's no head that's controlling it, right? It just kind of happens, right? That, that in fact there is, in a capitalist market economy, a lot of manipulation and a lot of skewing that happens based on, you know, banks and industry and all, all this stuff. And that we're for the economy as a whole being run not by a chaotic market system, but by planning. And again, we don't mean a central committee somewhere in Moscow, right? We mean democratic planning by federated structures. Um, so yeah, I saw a question. Were you aware, I think it's in David Graeber's book, that he points out that Adam Smith actually was speaking of God the deity when he used the expression the invisible hand, that it wasn't the principle of economics, that he was literally speaking about the God he believed in. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. That doesn't surprise me, though. Um, incidentally, Adam Smith uh, spoke of things like the capitalist division of labor, where one person tightens a you know tightens one screw on one car on an assembly line for for you know for eight hours a day. Um, you know, obviously the car factories didn't exist in Adam Smith's time, but that division of labor and the exploitation, right? He, Adam Smith, the founding father of market capitalism, said that this division of labor um, needs to be checked by a commons and a people who are who are willing to keep it in check because of labor and the alienation it creates in workers will create people, and I think the quote is, um, as, as miserable and stupid as people can be, or so, something like that. The, the idea being that this is not a good way for human beings to live. And even Adam Smith uh, expressed these concerns. And Adam Smith was in favor of a market only on the assumption that under conditions of perfect liberty, markets will create perfect equality. Now, you know, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. We've yet to experience conditions of perfect liberty uh, since, uh, you know, for, for centuries and centuries now. Um, so there's really not a way to know. But in either case, uh, you know, it's, 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 and I'm glad you asked that because it's good to sort of put out there that, you know, these people, they idol Adam Smith, Thomas Jefferson, all these people, like, actually said some pretty, some pretty subversive anti-capitalist things. Uh, we just don't read those particular sections of the books that they wrote. Um, so we're in favor of democratic uh, management and planning of the economy. Um, the other thing we're in favor of, um, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the word communism. Again, this does not mean Central Committee in Moscow. I'm just gonna, just gonna throw that, that idea totally away. It's not what we mean. Um, we believe that, uh, as I said before, common ownership um, or non-ownership, depending on your philosophical bent, um, of things like land, water, things that are vitally necessary for the survival of everyone. Um, should be commonly owned and controlled by all of society democratically. Um, and that we're in favor of communism, and what we do mean by communism is, um, is the classical uh, Marxist quote, which is, um, from each according to ability to each according to need, right? That necessary goods and services in a society should be distributed to people not according to how much money they have, and not even according to how much they work for it necessarily, um, but according to what they need, right? So if someone is starving, they deserve food. That's it, that's the equation. There are no other factors. If someone is sick, they deserve to be able to see a doctor. Whether or not they have health insurance, whether or not they have any money, right? These things are irrelevant. If you're sick, you get help, right? That's the equation, no other factors. Um, and that, uh, yeah. So that's a little controversial because um, it says from each according to their ability. Yes. To each according to their need. So what you focused on is the need aspect in terms of distribution. Sure. But it doesn't sound anarchic to me to say from each according to their ability. Because if someone is not willing to make a contribution according to their ability, ability, and some coercion is called for. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. It's not the easiest question, but it's an important one. Um, so the the assumption behind when 
that particular quote when Karl Marx said it, um, he was operating under the assumption, and I think the correct assumption, but it is an assumption, that in a society that is genuinely controlled by the people, where society as a whole is active and involved in the way that the economy is run and in running their own lives, in such a society where we are not alienated by all the ridiculous things that happen to us in society today, that in such a society, getting people to generally contribute to the common pot will not be a problem. Um, now, again, this is an assumption, right? We're guessing, maybe not. Um, but uh, throughout attempts at anarchist revolution throughout history, um, we've seen how some societies have, have taken to, uh, uh, to fixing this. For instance, um, in, in Spain, uh, in, in, I believe, Catalonia, um, it, might, it was either Catalonia or Barcelona, in either case, um, in revolutionary Spain, uh, where the, the CNT, the National Confederation of Labor in Spain during the Civil War, 1936 to 1939, the anarchist trade union, the CNT, controlled much of Spain. Um, and there was a problem at one point uh, because the lots of the um, garbage workers, lots of the city sanitation workers had either gone off to join the fight, had gone off to the front to fight the fascists, or they had, you know, picked better jobs because they were working as garbage men because that's the job they could get and they didn't really you know grow up wanting to be garbage men um, and so there was this problem you know garbage was piling up in the streets of I believe Barcelona um, and and so the CNT you know at you know it started to you know it's a city it starts to stink after a while and there's trash everywhere and so committees began to form on shop floors um, and in, in neighborhoods throughout, uh, throughout the city. And they went to the, the CNT, the, uh, the CNT, I don't know, whatever the administrative branch was that controlled the city, and they said, look, this is a problem. We need to clean up the garbage. And they said, okay, neighborhood committees will figure out who's gonna do it. And so there were CNT committees in various neighborhoods that coordinated the getting up of trash. And a lot of it was like, you know, uh, like, say, jury duty, right? You know, people don't generally love jury duty, but we have a system for doing it that's fairly equitable, right? We, you know, draw lots or, or whatever system, right? There is, for things, for necessary labor, labor that is needed, right? Sure, an individual has the right to be lazy if they want to, but in general, uh, society will take care of its, will, will I was about, I was about to swear. Um, you know, society will take care of, of its business, of the things that needs to be done. I don't think that anyone, I don't think that society as a whole is so in danger of dying from its own laziness that if there's a crop shortage, no one will get off, off their butt and farm. You know, I don't think that if there's trash everywhere, everyone's going to be so lazy as to say, no, someone else clean it up, right? People aren't, aren't that incredibly stupid. Um, sorry, so uh, I'm going to go... Uh, here and here's because okay. yeah. Well, what is your point? You know, anarchism is a lack of structure. It certainly needs structure in society. What is your point? You've been yeah. I've been so, sitting here for three minutes. That's not fair to you to say that. Sure, haven't made some. So so so, remarks, so but so far you seem to be meandering without much point. Well, if I so, may, so, he was responding to a question that I had, and I'd like to follow up on my question. So let, let me just, that won't take long to address that at all. Um, so more than three minutes ago, um, I began this presentation with, uh, with the section of what anarchism isn't. And one of the things that I think I neglected to mention is this notion of structuralness, right? This is a lie that's been told about anarchism by people who are hostile to it. Anarchism proposes an extremely organized society, a society that's much more organized than the one we have now. We propose less chaos. We propose simply that this structure and this organization be democratic rather than tyrannical and dictatorial. Whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I can get back to that, but we haven't heard from you. Of course, I missed the beginning too. Sorry to say, but um, I wanted to. Sorry, um, I was being snarky. Ask you about. Sorry. I wanted to ask you about um, situations like uh, Somalia, where um, there, you know, the state fell apart, and sure. instead of it becoming a democratic and lovely place, it became run by warlords. Who, sure. Because there's always a few um, bad apples who will uh, 
who think that violence is the way to get their way, and then they use fear to get a lot of other people to um, sure. to uh, go along with them, and uh, or to sometimes enthusiastically, most mostly not. But okay. um, that's the number one um, problem, I think. You know that people see. With, I don't think I'm a woman. Yes. Sure, sure. Um, and that, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, firstly, I'd like to say that I'm not an expert on the situation in Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I understand the general, uh, the general stuff you're talking about, and I'm sort of aware of, of what's going on in that area of the world. Um, I would say that, um, firstly, uh, anarchists favor revolution, not collapse. Um, we d you know, so the situation in Somalia is not a state that doesn't exist because it was overthrown by the people. Right? It's a state that doesn't exist because the state failed, um, you know, and that's and that's a fundamentally different thing. Um, but I would say that there are, in a lot of places in the world where there are failed states, there are certain embryos of anarchist organization, right, that exist at the neighborhood level, at the community level, you know, groups of families, things like that, that are that exist in order to help those people survive and struggle in that awful situation. Um, but I think that. Things like Somalia and lots of other uh, places in the underdeveloped world, um, there um, a lot of those situations and, like you said, warlordism and, and things like this exist because the global economy, right, has created a situation in which there is artificial uh, artificial scarcity and really intense artificial scarcity, right? Like Somalia didn't have um, didn't have famine all didn't have perpetual famine and poverty before it was colonized, right? It didn't have, you know, so these things are not, you know, it's, it's not that the land in Somalia can't bear, you know, enough resources to provide for its people, and it's not like the people in Somalia are just so, you know, uh, lazy or stupid or deficient that they can't provide for themselves, right? Neither of these things are true. Um, it's because the global economy has failed to, has, has won, like, wrecked Somalia, like, a century ago, and has failed to, either allow it to rebuild itself or to, you know, provide some sort of remuneration for the immense harm that was done in. Um, so I would say that that's a, that's a result of the global market system. Um, and I think that in a, in a global, in a global uh, anarchist revolutionary situation, that would be one of the first and foremost problems. And, and as, as a non-expert uh, in the situation in Somalia, I can't provide, like, specific prescriptions for that. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that that's, you know, Somalia is an example of one of the most uh, sort of desperate points uh, in the world for that sort of thing. Um, but I, ju I just want to distinguish between, uh, between, uh, 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 between no state because, uh, because of, of a man and no state because it failed uh, and collapsed into oblivion. Right? Um, sorry, I had something from you a while ago. Yeah, so I wanted to follow up on the basic question I was asking you, which is, to my mind, uh, the problem of motivation. Um, so what I had asked is, um, um, I said that uh, my understanding, and I think you'll agree with this, is that anarchism is committed to non-coercion. And so what I asked is, the first part of the principle of distribution that you named is from each according to their ability. And, and so, and, and, and your answer, which uh, has some merit, you said that, um, that people respond to real urgent needs and often don't need to be coerced in order to respond to that. And I think that's very true and legitimate and that sort of should help us understand the general situation. So, uh, uh, but the problem still stands. There will still be individuals who will um, oppose what is in the general interest. Yeah, sure. so, so what I want to push you in the direction of is talking about morality. Because it seems to me Are that- Are you asking the question under what circumstances would an anarchist society use coercion? Is that, is that what, 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 I think the way we think about these kinds of problems in our society today fall under the morality. So it's a matter of, how do you get people to do what they ought to do? Sure. So I, I think but without without uh, without falling back into portion. Yeah. So so I think I would I would just and and I I, I acknowledge that you acknowledged 
uh, my answer before that generally people don't need coercion to do what's best for them because I don't think people are created naturally stupid. Um, um, I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe that to be generally true. Um, but I think, I think, uh, I think there is, there is a, a and that's a really in-depth question. Um, and great. Uh, I think that there are situations in which, um, for instance, uh, nuclear power, right? Uh, nuclear nuclear power, if we started getting rid of all of it today, we would not be rid of it within the next several centuries. It's just that long-term a problem, right? And so if in a, in a, if in a particular situation, you know, all the you know, workers at a nuclear power plant say, we're not gonna do it, we're leaving, we're gone, no one else knows how to prevent a meltdown, I think society has the right to say, no, get back to work, right? Because you don't, because you don't have the right to blow up a city. Right, because I, so I think that there are there's a certain amount of things like that, um, but I think I think that in general, I also want to clarify that I don't think that anarchism is committed to non-coercion in the way that you framed it. Anarchism is against unjust coercion, right? And I think like the like it's like it's okay to pull a five-year-old out from out from in front of a truck. I think it's okay to avert, say, nuclear disaster by means of coercion. I don't, I don't see a problem with that, and I've not met an anarchist who would. Um, and I, I realize that's an extreme example. Um, I, you know, I don't see the future, so I don't know what like specific prescriptions for all these different situations would be. Um, but, but I would also add to that that there's this sort of open dilemma, right? Because life is complicated, and there are open dilemmas. That I think that in a world where people are active and conscious and and moving together in a particular when society is active and not alienated and not oppressed in all the ways that it is right now I have I have a basic and and this is not um, you know maybe this is a, a little bit of a faith thing I have faith that humanity is capable of tackling those decisions right I, ha I have a general my reading of history tells me that people are capable of handling huge problems in incredibly creative and uh, Ways. Um, so I so I want to I want to go to you and then I I'm, I'm I'm trying to get through the I have a little bit more of this but no. um, someone I believe spoke about um, spoke about uh, morality. Uh, what I was thinking also is along those lines of. Um, of our personal responsibility, why uh, some may resent um, giving to others according to their need uh, on the condition, you know, conditionally. Well, if you need because you're, you shirk your responsibility, then uh, I can't justify uh, you know, you're sick because da, da 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 rather than you got struck with some disease. So I think that when it comes to anarchism, people are um, not necessarily hostile, but you know, there's there's a bit of a stretch required. Sure. Um, there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement of human nature in your in, you know in your in your theory in your positions no matter what and under any system, no matter what you call it, there's human nature. There are aggressive people, there are greedy people, there are evil people, and somehow they manage to subvert whatever system there is, no matter how idealistic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I will stipulate to everything that you're saying, it's just that, um, it may be a bit naive. Okay. Um, so, so uh, you, you brought up a lot of stuff there. Um, the first thing that I would say is that I think uh, in any discussion of human nature, and I don't want to spend too much time on that because that's a huge discussion. Yes. That could take hours and hours and hours. Um, but I think that human nature isn't static. Right? I, I think that human nature is structured by the conditions in which people live. Um, and I think that a lot of times when people talk about human nature now, um, what they're talking about is human nature under capitalism, um, and I think I I don't and and again maybe this is maybe this is faith, um, you know, but sure 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 
Um, and I think that you know, for, for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, what we've had is class society. Even before capitalism, we had class divided society. We had societies of haves and have nots and have sums, right? We've had, you know, before it was before it was the capitalists and the workers, it was the kings and the and the nobility and the knights and the serfs and the you know, and slaves and, and there were you know all those things. It's been a long time. It's been it's been tens of thousands of years since there has been generally on this planet classless society. Um, now, the majority of human history, um, which like since <laughs> the majority of human history, um, and this doesn't get talked about a whole lot, is what Marx called primitive communism. Um, we existed for, uh, for I think 40,000 years or something like that uh, before major class divisions arose uh, in human society. And I'm not advocating going back to that, but I think it illustrates that people are capable of living in ways that are other than this one. Um, but I would also say that the, the, the specific question you posed um, about you know what happens if someone uh, you know if someone needs more not because they you know have some unfortunate thing that they can control but because they messed up in some way um, or they did something wrong. I think that a lot of that is is underpinned one by scarcity, which is often artificial, right? Um, but even in situations uh, of scarcity, real or artificial, I think that there's uh, an easily observable distinction between. Um, between someone who needs food because they, you know, um, because they're particularly poor, or they don't have the, you know, in, in those these ways that we've been talking about, and someone who, you know, uh, you know, just threw their threw their their food rations away or something, you know, like that. Th there's an observable distinction between those two, and I think that, and again, I think that society and people in general are intelligent enough to account for that in the ways that we organize ourselves. Right? Um, and I don't see that as being a ginormous problem. Now, if someone, if there's a situation, if there's a situation where there's only a limited amount of, say, food, and somebody, you know, just, you know, throws it away or, you know, or does something stupid, um, is society obligated to give them more? Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a quandary. I, and I'm not a, um, you know, I'm I'm, not, I'm by no means the, the world's greatest moral philosopher, I, you know, and I don't and I don't I'm not in that situation, um, so I don't know exactly what would be done. Um, I think that I think that again, this is one of those things that I, I sort of trust people to deal with. Um, but it's not working, not even in this country. <laughs> sure, uh, I mean, but people but, are in people are in dire need. Sure. Many of whom are sure. um, children. Um, but yet, there's no, um, there doesn't seem to be that, um, that uh, idealistic uh, response. And we certainly, everyone knows that in America we throw away enough food to be a small country. Absolutely. So there is enough food here, the resources are here, yet, um, Many, many, many. You know, I don't have the statistics in any, but many people are hungry. Sure. Um, so this sort of it's obvious. Um, doesn't it doesn't happen sure. that way? Sure. And, and, <laughs> and my real life, it doesn't happen. Sure. Like sure. That. And my main response to that is that we don't at the moment live in an anarchist society. We live under capitalism right now, and scarcity is the way that the capitalists want it. Um, and I think that I think that the other thing is that as 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 your specific your specific question as it related to the larger conversation about anarchism was sort of you know how much uh, I think that the majority of the problems the sort of political problems in the world today right these things like massive hunger scarcity dire poverty the world over um, these things are not primarily or even in significant part created by failures and personal responsibility. Right? I think I think that you know, things like that, stupid people or bad people or evil people, are going to exist or not. Um, but I don't think that's the variable. I think that people have been, I think that the, the proportion of humanity that's just stupid because their brains are that way, it is constant, right? I don't see that that having changed a whole lot throughout, throughout history. Um, but I think what's changed is the way the society is organized. And right now, society is organized in such a way that a tiny fraction of a 1% of the, 
of the world's population runs just about everything. And the rest of us are just kind of left out there to you know, get as good a job as we can and cut as good a deal in on this as we can um, while hoping to avoid destitution and horror. Right? And I think that that way that things are set up institutionally is a much bigger problem, and that's what anarchism is designed to address. Anarchism is by no means, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're going to fix everything in the world, right? There's not going to be a utopia, right? We don't. That's not. That's not a realistic thing. We're not saying that anarchism will solve every problem the world's ever had or every problem every person's ever had. We're saying it will solve this particular problem. It will solve the problem of capitalism and class society and the oppressions that exist within it. Um, I just want to, uh, you got something, and then I really want to run through just the remainder of this real quick, and then we can just open it up. Okay, yeah, um, so I was just going to add that the general anti-authoritarianism uh, within anarchism has, over time, evolved uh, into, uh, into really, um, really wonderful analyses on um, anti-racism and feminism, um, and that a lot of these predated sort of when they broke out into the mainstream, which is to say the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, the anarchists within the IWW have been practicing um, anti-racist unionism since since the IWW was founded in 1914 or 1905. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, anarchist feminism, uh, most famous uh, in Spain, the uh, Mujeres Libres, uh, which is free women, uh, of, uh, within the Spanish Revolution, uh, really developed some of the earliest forms um, of 20th century feminism. Uh, of what would later become, uh, you know, supposedly second wave and partially third wave feminism. Um, I, I can't spend too much time on that, unfortunately. Um, as far as the, the 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 third third of what I was going to talk about, which is um, strategy, which is how do we get from the awful society we have now to something that even vaguely resembles an anarchist society? The first the first answer to that is that it's a long haul. Right? Um, that this is not something that's going to happen next week. Um, but, uh, but that it absolutely is something that is possible. It's something that's almost happened many, 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 many times in the last century and a half. Um, it's, come, it's come so close. Um, as far as strategy, anarchists propose direct action, which is to say that if you have a problem with your boss, you have a problem with your landlord, you have a problem, uh, you, know, you have a, a, a political problem that you solve it yourself along with your community, your coworkers, whatever. You don't say, go to your congressman and say, hey, can you pass a law saying this, that, and the other thing. Um, first reason for that is that it doesn't work. It generally doesn't work because guess who pays for the campaigns of these politicians, right? Um, and, and the state has always been in the pockets of the capitalists and of big business. Um, and so it doesn't make any sense to go to your go to your enemy's left hand for relief from what your enemy's right hand is doing. Um, um, but we also believe that through direct action and through mass direct action, right, not one person going and punching their boss in the face, right, that generally results in you going to jail for a week. Um, but, uh, but in mass direct action, people develop the ability not only to struggle as, as a whole, as a community, as a society, um, but begin to confront questions that are further down the line like a lot of questions that have been asked, I don't know the answers to because I'm not in that situation, I'm not anywhere near that situation. The nearer you get, the more idea you have toward, you know, there are, um, there, was a, there was a paper uh, that got written in Spain about exactly how we should organize the anarchist economy after the revolution. It was super, I mean, it's long, like it's, it's a small book. I mean, it's very in-depth about the economics of Spain and its agriculture and all this stuff. And you couldn't write that until 1938 when they were on the verge of, of a revolution that could implement these things, because until you're in the situation, you just don't know. Um, and so we advocate people struggling uh, themselves uh, as, as struggle progresses. Um, we also advocate prefigurative politics, which is to say that if, if you conduct a revolution that is controlled by a tiny central committee of people that then overthrows the state and tries to implement anarchism, it's not going to work. Right? And this is the lesson we've learned from the Soviet Union, from you know, from so-called socialist and communist revolutions in the last century. We've learned that if you have a single party that tries to lead and carry the flag, right? If you have uh, you know some some distortion like that, 
then you're not going to come out with freedom. You're not going to come out with uh, the sort of free anarchism uh, that we advocate. The only way to do, the only way to implement socialist democracy, right, actual socialist democracy, is through organizations of struggle that are socialist and democratic as much as they can be at that moment. Right? Um, so, for instance, if you know, if the if the organization of revolution is um, you know is really patriarchal, is mostly run by men, is most of the decisions are made by men, right? Then the revolution that those organizations create is going to be patriarchal, right? We, s we see that there's a relationship between means and ends, and so we advocate the means being as democratic and anarchistic as possible in the in the here and now. Um, so the and and the very last thing is that. Uh, unlike, again, a lot of so-called socialist and communist uh, revolutions and movements, um, we don't see, uh, so Buffalo Class Action, right, is, a, is an anarchist organization. We're explicitly anarchist organization. You have to be an anarchist to be a member. Uh, you have to participate in, you know, in trying to build and, and advance uh, these ideas and these movements in order to be a member, right? We don't believe that Buffalo Class Action is going to be the group that leads the revolution. That's not how it's going to be. Um, you know, we don't we don't seek that. We don't think it's realistic. We understand that the agents of revolution will be large, massive organizations of workers and people and communities. That these are the agents, right? And it would be a horrible, horrible mistake for us to try to plant our control on top of them. That the best way to implement implement anarchism is to participate in these organizations and these struggles as equals and walk with them through the struggle and contribute to their internal democracy, right? So we, um, you know, so we participate in, you know, in labor struggles or land struggles or housing struggles as much as we can. We don't, um, we don't seek to become like the leadership uh, of, of these organizations. Um, we're also in there to, to combat, um, you know, counter-revolutionary tendencies, um, you know, if there are uh, if there are vicious racists in these organizations, uh, you know we're there to say no. Racism has no place in 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 labor, you know, or you know, or sexism has no place in labor, or you know, or getting your getting your massive union to put all their energy into electing a certain presidential candidate, right? That this is not the right way to go. This is a bad strategy, which will corrupt what you're trying to do. Um, and, and so these, uh, these are the things that were there. We're also there to contribute strategies, right? Because as, uh, you know, as anarchists, most of us have been involved in lots of struggles for a while. Um, and we propose as best strategies that we think will work and will best advance the goals of the struggle, not a Buffalo class action. And through, and if these, and we propose them, if, if, people, if people vote to do them, then we do them. If they say no, we don't force it, right? And the way that we envision anarchism becoming a powerful force in these movements is by demonstrating our value in struggle, right? That we're not gonna take people aside and be like, listen, you need to read this book about anarchism because it's right and without it you're gonna be wrong, right? That's not what we do. We say, look, we are anarchists, we have these ideas, and we're gonna try to use these ideas to help you and, and help you do what all of us are, do, are trying to do and are struggling for. And if and when it works, if and when those things are successful and they work, then people might start to go, hey, what's this anarchism thing? There, there might be something there, right? That's, that's the way in which we seek to build anarchism as a revolutionary, uh, as a revolutionary force. Um, and, and lastly, too, uh, we always operate honestly in good faith. We never hide the fact that we're in Buffalo Class Action or that we're in the same organization or what our purposes are. Um, and we also seek to connect these struggles to each other and to a larger class struggle. So the, the struggle for housing and con community control of land is not separate from the struggle for decent wages you know, and the right to a safe work environment. That these are, in fact, two different parts of one struggle of the masses of us. Of you know of the 99 percent, if you like, of the working class against its oppressors, against the tiny minority, less than a percentage point, the capitalists who run who run this country, who run this world, and who really are the source of the major problems in our community.
So that was what I had. Um, I don't know how much. Oh, oh no, no. Uh, I'm still for 54 minutes. Okay. So, uh, what, what's the time wise? What's if there's one or two questions we can do. Okay. Yeah. So, um, questions that folks have. Uh, if there's anyone who hasn't who hasn't said anything or hasn't asked anything yet, I'm gonna prioritize those people. Um, okay. Uh, appears not. But uh, we, can, can I just say one thing? Yeah. Let me actually participate in this way. But what I'm getting from this is is that anarchism basically fundamentally has sort of an optimistic view of. I guess human nature, uh, what community can do. It's not positing a specific structure. It's basically saying if um, certain oppressive structures, we can trust in the humanity you know, of the masses, maybe to organize in small groups and to sort of. start to overcome. There's not a structure or a government you're proposing. So, it's so, more of an idealistic kind of vision of what we could be. So that's that's not untrue. Um, I, and and I, I maybe I, I wasn't I wasn't super clear about this. Um, there's um, a, a thing a phrase called the anarchist method, which comes out of um, an Italian anarchist called Erico Malatesta, um, who has the idea that look there are there are people. Who have been trying since since there's been socialism and, and labor and capitalism since there's been those things people have sat down and tried to like okay let me figure out exactly what a better world would look like um, those were the utopian socialists in the 19th century um, nowadays there's things like um, Michael Albert uh, and Paracon there's a book called participatory economics that attempts to do that um, and there's a bunch of other attempts to like figure out what a good society would look like um, and then there's also but there's a lot of people who say you know what look we just need to get rid of these oppressive structures, and whatever course history takes is the course history will take. Um, that's been the classical Marxist line, um, and it's and there's truth to both of those things. The trick is that with the with figuring it out all beforehand, you start to become really sort of set in your ways and stodgy. And what if you're wrong? And those aren't flexible structures. And you're telling people in the future how they're supposed to live, which is just kind of absurd. Um, and the problem with just history will take the course that history will take um, is that. Uh, for, for Marxists in the 20th century, it led to you know these atrocious things in the Soviet Union and in China, and people just say, hey, well, that was the course that history took, you know, and and who are we to to question, you know, the, the historical development of socialism, right? And so the, the and so what Malatesta proposed is a is a sort of a sort of halfway point um, where we say, look, it's okay to have these ideas, but we need to be flexible and experimental. So the world is a big place. Um, and there are going to be, there isn't going to be one economic system that immediately works everywhere. Um, and as long as we don't reconstitute capitalism and class society, or you know, like slavery or something awful, as long as we don't reconstitute the oppressive structures that we've overthrown, we can experiment and try different things. So maybe, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Buffalo wants to try, uh, you know, uh, sort of cooperatives. With, you know, in a in a sort of free market structure, but with everything being democratic cooperatives, and sort of coordinate that. Okay, we can try that for a little bit. You know, maybe some people want to have like in Paracon, there's workers councils, and then there's uh, councils of consumers that like coordinate, negotiate with each other. We can try that. Maybe some places will want to go straight into from each according to ability to each according to need. That's fine too. And we'll try these different things and see which ones work, which parts of different ones work, and which ones don't, and people will figure them out. So it's so there, it's not that we need to have no standards, um, but we have general criteria within which we can experiment. Um, so uh, well, I just had like a quick question: is like, can you give like a um, a very short, abbreviated history of the actual group Buffalo class action? How long it's been around? What kinds of um, you know actions and accomplishments it's had uh, during its inception uh, up to now? Sure, I, and I think that'll be a, that'll be <laughs> that'll be a decent like uh, plug to to close this with, I guess, because I think where where time is is, uh, is a factor. Um, so um, I've been with Buffalo Class Action for I think two years now um, since I moved here uh, to go to school at UB. Um, it's existed for I think. 
don't, uh, I'm not certain. It's existed for a number of years before that. I, I, I'll have to check on exactly how many years, but we've, we've been around for a while. Uh, we've been around for a number of years in Buffalo. Um, and I know that we, we worked um, for a long time with People United for Sustainable Housing. We still maintain a friendly relationship with them. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in cross-membership. Um, for a while, it was a, it was a requirement uh, of, of members of class action to be a member of, of, uh, of PUSH. Um, and we, we participated in housing struggles a lot. Um, we engaged for a little while in an attempt to unionize hotel workers uh, at one of the hotels downtown. Um, we've been involved in uh, tenants organizing with Buffalo Tenants United. Um, we recently have begun the, the early stages of starting uh, a, Buffalo, um, a Buffalo branch or chapter or whatever. Um, of Take Back the Land slash Occupy Our Homes, um, which is about uh, you know finding empty homes um, and homeless folks who need them, matching them up with each other. It's like how do you solve homelessness, right? Really, really simple direct action. There's more empty um, homes than homeless people. Right. There's about three times more empty homes than there are homeless people. Um, so this is an imminently solvable problem. Um, but yeah, and we've also been uh, somewhat involved with student struggles um, through the Defend Education Committee at UB. Um, which is affiliated with NYSER, New York, New York Students Rising, um, which has been involved in a lot of the budget stuff. Um, we've been somewhat involved in Occupy. I've not been one of the folks who's been that involved in Occupy within class action, so I'm not the most qualified to talk about that. Um, but yeah, and, and we do educationals. Um, like this, a lot of them are at Burning Books, which is over on Connecticut Street. Um, yeah, great. And uh, Buffalo Class Action at Gmail. If you want, if you have any questions or want to contact us, our website is buffaloclassaction.com. Thank you so much, Crescenzo. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for listening and for participating. In September, we have uh, the director of the Peace Center coming to talk about finding social justice in later life. So hopefully, people will come to that as well. Thank you very much. Um, I can I can stick around for a little bit. I'm not sure I I'm